I think it's critically important to follow your passion and follow the things that, that drive you, that excite you. And if you're doing the things that you love, um, it becomes second nature to keep doing them. I realized that every single clinical question that I ever had, every research question, all my creative thought came from the clinic. I think mentorship um, is an investment. You have to invest in people. You have to give them the time and you need to, um, you know, uh, relish in their success. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Unco Daily. Today on Unco Influencers is a dear friend of mine, uh, Professor Rana McKay. Uh, welcome, Rana. Thank you for being with us today. Rana is a professor of medicine and urology at uh, University of California, San Diego. She's the associate director of clinical sciences and co-leader of the GU Oncology program at the Moore's Cancer Center. She is a medical oncologist who specializes in treating people with urogenital cancers. She is a very well known in the field, so she does not need much of introduction. And I'll leave all this uh, her accomplishments uh, uh, to explore during our interview. Rana, thank you very much for having a time with us, and welcome to Onco Daily. Thank you so much for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. Uh, thank you. Uh, Rana, what is the key of your success? You know, I think um, really enjoying what you do. I think it's critically important to follow your passion and follow the things that, that drive you, that excite you. And if you're doing the things that you love, um, it becomes second nature to keep doing them. Um, and it's not a uh, a chore or a, or a, a task, but rather um, just an extension of who you are. Why medicine and why oncology? Very good question. So I think, you know, in oncology in particular, I find that we all have a, a personal connection somehow that drives us into the field. I feel oncology is very unique and special in that kind of way um, and takes a unique and special individual. I think that that kind of elects to choose this um, career path. I think for me, um, you know, uh, cancer hit very close to home when I was young. Um, you know, my mom was in medicine. She was in nursing and um, was diagnosed at an early age with breast cancer when I was still, um, you know, in high school and had no idea what was going on. You hear the big C word and it's just like a bunch of fear and just not knowing what the future holds and what's going to happen. And I think I was really scared when she was diagnosed and felt somewhat helpless with the, like my ability to be able to help her when she first was diagnosed. And she, um, was on, you know, um, you know, chemotherapy and radiation and had surgery and, and, you know, wasn't, you know, didn't have modern day antiemetics and just was dealing with all of that. And, and she got into a remission and then, you know, um, several years later, she ended up having a recurrence and went through the same thing again. And, you know, it was really a, um, just a very, um, influential experience on me that I did not want people to suffer in that kind of way and felt like there was, you know, that we can do better as a field in providing, you know, uh, comprehensive, like compassionate care. And it's actually what drove me into research too, because we're not curing everybody with cancer. And We've got so much more to do um, with regards to making people live longer, making patients live better. And um, because our standard of care is not sufficient across the board, I think that drove me into clinical research. So I think those two experiences are largely, I think, drove me into oncology. Um, and it's it's been a really great experience thus far. Thank you for sharing, Karana. Um, you... Uh... You are among top doctors in San Diego, recognized as one of America's best pro prostate cancer oncologists, selected for, to be the lead woman oncologist of the year. 
and you were also among Uncle Daly's 100 influential women in oncology. <laughs> so, I mean, how this trajectory of, uh, of career in this very young age, I mean, how it happened, like how your education went and then the career. Yeah. Please explore so I, a bit more. No, happy to share. So, um, you know, I... Uh, I grew up in Florida and actually did my undergrad and medical school training at the University of Florida. And um, it was actually a wonderful place to train. Um, they were very grounded in medical education, very grounded in compassionate clinical care. I was in an accelerated program um, through the University of Florida, which really, I think, um, allowed me the opportunity to kind of, um, you know, do well and uh, follow my passion. And following the completion of uh, med school, I did my uh, residency training at Johns Hopkins, which was an absolutely fantastic place to train. Um, the uh, clinical training is top notch. Um, it's very much driven by the interns and the residents. Um, and uh, the firm structure at the, at the um, Hopkins is really formative in kind of building you and teaching people actually how to be a doctor um, as a number one step. And I think I began to, um, you know, really get plugged into oncology when I was at, at Johns Hopkins. You know, it's interesting. I thought I was going to do hematologic malignancies and bone marrow transplant because that was super exciting when you were a, a resident and training on the services. And I remember I was actually working on a project and it's funny how things come full circle we um, had seen that a large, there was a, there was a increased preponderance of patients that were on the AML leukemia service that had had a history of prostate cancer and breast cancer. And we actually, like my first ASCO abstract was dissecting the, uh, um, you know, clinical characteristics of people who had AML with a prior history of breast and prostate cancer. And it's funny to come full circle now because now we're beginning to understand, oh, there's like a risk of DNA repair, um, germline alterations in people with prostate cancer. We didn't know that back then. And it's funny how that was actually one of the first projects I worked on with Dr. Judy Karp, who's now since retired, but was a tremendous kind of mentor when I was at, at um, Hopkins. And then from there, I did my residence, my fellowship training at the Dana-Farber. And I think that's, that's really where I learned what clinical research was all about. I, I had really no idea what it was until I actually was an oncology fellow at the Farber and learning about clinical trials and designing trials, designing therapeutic studies. I work closely with uh, Mary Ellen Taplin, who's continues to be my mentor in prostate cancer, Tony Shawiri. Um, my mentor, colleague, friend, um, life coach in uh, in kidney cancer. And I think a lot of people who I think, you know, gave me the opportunity and um, to, to succeed, who kind of believed in me to give me the, okay, you work on this project, then let's see if you can execute. You work on this project and, you know, if you do this one well, we'll give you another one. You do this one well, you, you, you'll, you'll get it, you know, and so working with Phil Kantoff, who was um, leading the GU group, George Jeff Shapiro. I mean, they were really formative. Um, Bob Mayer in um, shaping who the researcher that I am today, actually, because I learned how to design trials smartly. And um, I was really wed to the clinic. Um, and uh, I, I, the first step for fellowship, once I got into kind of more specialized training in GU, was I really wanted to learn how to take care of patients with genital urinary malignancy. I wanted to I wanted to be the expert. I wanted to learn all the nuances. And um, you know, I don't have a lab per se. We have a, a dry lab, if you will, at uh, UC San Diego. But I became, you know, very very early on. I realized that every single clinical question that I ever had, every research question, all my creative thought came from the clinic. It came from why are patients, you know, why is this population behaving this way? Why is this drug not working in this group? Why is, why does this pattern of spread happen? And I think it's because of those clinical observations and unmet needs that drove every single scientific question. And so I think um, that was sort of my, my upbringing. And I think, like I said at the beginning, like when you're doing the things that you love, it's very evident 
and you put your best foot forward, people see it, they see your passion, it drives you. And I think it just becomes second nature. You know, my next question was to ask about your mentors, but you ran ahead <laughs> and yeah. answered that question already. So I will ask for I'll ask the other question. Who are your mentees? Oh, very good question. And I will say to to add to add to the the question of who are your mentors, I think mentorship is important throughout your entire career. And the mentors that you may have as a resident are going to teach you a certain skill set. And as a fellow, it may be different. As a junior attending, it may be different. As a mid-career person, you may be seeking guidance and mentorship from somebody else that's going to offer advice on leadership, professionalism, how to bring people together. So there's going to be people that are going to be mentors um, and give guidance around different parts. So I don't believe in this. You only have one mentor who's that's it. Like you can have many mentors and they're going to guide you in different kind of ways at different um, transition points in your career. I think with regards to my mentees, I feel like I've gotten a reputation at UCSD that if you if you want to do research and you want to do clinical research and you want to publish and be out there, go talk to McKay. <laughs> and I feel like I've gotten this kind of reputation and, and I love it. Like I love, you know, undergrads, med students, residents reaching out, um, junior faculty and really like teaching them um, how to do research, how to care for patients. And I think, you know, I learn a lot from my mentees. Um, you know, it, it, for me, the clinical question can be anything like uh, we, we do research across the spectrum from database analyses to lifestyle interventions to therapeutic interventions, IITs, and a lot of the mentees kind of drive some of that creativity, which I think is really awesome. Um, you know, UA Chen, who's junior faculty now at UCSD, it's been amazing mentoring him. Sharon Choi, one of our fellows who's going to be recently joining um, on faculty in a couple of uh, weeks, actually. Justin Shia, Elizabeth Pan, um, they're both attendings. Elizabeth is at UCSF. She was working with us very closely. And mentorship can happen locally. There's many people that are local to UCSD, and there's many people that are that are afar, you know, one of my mentees who I care for dearly, who's done such an amazing job, um, Chin Mei Johnny, he's at University of Miami and was formerly in Boston. And we've been working together while he's been across the country, you know? So I think um, it, I think mentorship um, is an investment. You have to invest in people, you have to give them the time and you need to, um, you know, uh, relish in their success you know and that's uh, i think really important talking about leadership and mentorship i think first we met at during the ldp program right yes it was a wonderful program and um, now you are i mean now you are running for the ask a nominating committee just after the i mean How this LDP program uh, helped this uh, helped your career, and yeah. as well, like what are your plans for the future? Yeah, no, very good question. I mean, the LDP program was absolutely magnificent. You know, we all—it's a small group where you get to know each other very well, understand operationally how ASCO works, and also understand. Um, who you are as a leader, it's it it actually provided protected time for us to self-reflect around our leadership strategy and how to be more effective transformative leaders. It uh, certainly allowed me to understand, you know, what's my style um, to, you know, as you interact and engage with other leaders across your institution, within your research groups, you know, with it with other within other spheres of life actually understanding, okay, what's their leadership style and what's the most effective way, you know, if if I'm this type of person, what's the most effective way to communicate with somebody that's this type of person? You know, we, we did this DISC assessment where we kind of 
yeah. figured out sort of our own leadership styles. And I think it was very eye opening to understand that and then be able to apply it. There was a lot of self reflection over, well, what are things that you're currently encountering in your day to day profession? And, and the group of, you know, our group of 16, I mean, they were like, all amazing individuals just doing magnificent things within their institution and within, within their within their um, fields. And actually we had so much to learn from one another. So I would definitely encourage, you know, all, all individuals to like, you know, at this kind of mid-career stage to give yourself time to sit and self-reflect because the tools that took that, um, that you need to kind of get to this level are different than the tools that are needed to maybe take the next step uh, with regards to leadership. And so, um, you know, uh, I think that's important. It was a fantastic program um, and rec definitely recommend it for many. Thank you. Thank you very much. A uh, few more questions and I'm not going to take much of your time. So um, you have a, I mean, you are really very busy in the clinic, in the research with your leadership roles, and but you also have a beautiful family. Uh, you are a great mother. Uh, I mean, how you are uh, balancing this uh, work and life? Oh, very good question. I mean, it takes a village, right? Like I, it, I've got an amazing supportive husband. He is absolutely fantastic. Our, uh, um, you know, grandparents live nearby, they help. Um, we have a great community um, where we live, um, where the kids go to school. I've got four children and they are the loves of my life. They keep me grounded. And I think it's good in this day and age that they see that they're, you know, you know, that you have to work hard for things in life. And it's, it's a good trait to have. And they see that mom is working and doing things to help others and driving things. I think that's really important. And for me, I think it's been a lot of integration. Um, you know, I integrate my uh, work-life balance. I, I'm constantly multitasking. I, you know, my my kids and family and work have actually taught me to be incredibly efficient in the things that I do. Um, and, uh, you know, so that's been really wonderful. So I think it's a balancing act. I think the other thing for me is it's really important to find something outside of work that gives you joy, grounds you, helps you clear your mind. You know, for it's different for many people. For me, I, I thrive on you know, making sure to kind of exercise in the morning, clear my mind in the morning before the day starts. It's my opportunity to like sit and think, okay, this is reflecting on things from yesterday, planning out the day while I'm kind of doing my, my workout in the morning. And it really level sets me um, for the day. And um, I think that's been really helpful. And, and I think you know, many people have different kind of passions that drive them, whether it's music or or cooking or hiking or, or whatever it may be. Um, but for me, that's what keeps me grounded. If you describe yourself in one sentence, how you would describe? Ah, one sentence. Uh, yeah. I guess high energy. <laughs> <laughs> Passion and high energy. I don't know. Um, I feel like. That's uh, that's me. And the last question usually we ask, uh, who we should interview next? Oh, very good question. Oh, there's um, so many people. You know, I... Uh, Just two, one. Or two, I mean, yes. who, as you wish. Oh my God, I don't even, I, I don't know who you you have or haven't interviewed before. Um, That's okay. You, you just can <laughs> name anyone. Well, I'm thinking, you know, Mary Ellen Taplin, Tony Shawiri, those are two. I mean, Mary Ellen is, is fantastic um, woman um, leader in the field. She's gone through so much during her career. 
but has also done, you know, so much in the field of prostate cancer and clinical research. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, 20, 30 years ago, the prostate cancer world was largely, you know, male dominant field. And, you know, she was, a she was able to really, um, lead, um, the understanding of the androgen receptor in prostate cancer and different ways to therapeutically target that and has been the driver behind changing the paradigm for perioperative therapy for people with localized disease and um, is just also a great human being. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rana. Thanks for your time. I really enjoyed the interview and I'm sure our audience is going to do the same. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to Onka Daily on YouTube. Hit the bell icon to stay updated.